welcome. You're going to see some lots of images here, um, a little bit of code as well. We'll go through a cheaper notebook. But my name is Owen O'Connell. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the University of Limerick, um, and I basically work on electron microscopy, uh, where, wherein we, we look at uh, the structure of materials uh, on the atomic scale. So in the last year and a half, two years, I've kind of fallen in love with Python and being able to use it to, to help with the analysis. Um, so that's what we'll be doing today. We'll be looking at atomic resolution images and analyzing them using Python. Um, so first I just want to say big thanks to everyone down in Limerick. Um, their massive help, great group, um, brilliant supervisor Ushi, and uh, I've kind of dragged them into the Python sphere and a few of them are coming with me, which is great as well. Because there's a lot of stuff Python can, can help, uh, help us with. So I assume not many people know about the details of high resolution electron microscopy. Uh, and it's pretty interesting. We're actually seeing atoms and watching them move around. Um, and I'll just go through that really quickly. So this is a hand with a tweezers. And on the end of that tweezers is a three millimeter grid. If you look at the grid, it looks like this. It has uh, just a metal grid, either copper or gold. There's actually gold shortage at the moment. We can't buy them. Um, and then if you zoom in on those grids, you see those metal grids, those gold kind of bronzy ones? And we put our sample down on this, and that's those irregular shapes, those multicolored irregular shapes. And I assume some of you have heard of graphene. Um, this is, these are materials like graphene, these are materials I work on. And if you look at this uh, kind of slight contrast difference here between the membrane and our sample, that's a single, single layer of atoms. Um, and it's about 30 by 10 microns, and the guy who made this is just brilliant. It's really fantastic. So what we want to do is we want to put this sample in to a really, really good microscope. Um, and we put it in here. This is where we put our sample in. Now this is just a big giant column surrounded by loads of wires and detectors. And it's housed inside um, a big chamber. Uh, we call it, it's called the Titan. And there's a few of these around Ireland. And uh, we're really looking, really looking in Limerick to, to get to use one of these. And when we turn it on and do a lot of calibration, and then four years later, you can get an image like this. And if you look at a uh, bit, bit closer, every dot in this image is a single atom. And uh, we took this on Tuesday, and it has taken four years to get something this quality. Um, so we're pretty happy with that. So that's it. We make our sample, and we put our sample in this microscope, and we image. But how does it actually work inside? So we have to talk about wavelength, right, and resolution. But we'll just we'll focus on wavelength. So if we talk about the electron wavelength, and uh, we talk about the de Broglie wavelength, as the velocity of the electron goes up, the wavelength goes down, which means you have higher resolution because you can see smaller things. If you compare that, uh, compare the electron's wavelength, which is uh, 19 picometers, for example, at uh, 300 uh, kilovolts, uh, compare that to, to blue light, um, you can see a lot more with an electron. And that's why our, the resolution of our eyes are limited and why uh, light microscopes are limited to, to a certain size. So if we look at the picture we just saw a second ago, the inside of the microscope, and we look inside, we have our, our, a sample here. That's where we put our little sh single sheet of atoms. We basically get our electrons, shoot them from an electron gun, focus them to a point, and then raster scan it across the, across the material. And that's literally it. There's a load of stuff that goes into it, years, 60, 70, 80 years of technology, and a few Nobel Prizes. Uh, but what we're focused on is all of these signals that come out on this side. They also come out on the other side as well, and there's lots of different types of x-rays and, and, and secondary electrons. But we're focused on the ones that are collected by this round yellow detector here. It's a, called a Haddock detector, high angle meaning it's out at a high angle, annular is a circle, and it's dark field. But the great thing about this detector is that the, 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 the brighter the signal you get from it, it mean, that, that means it's a bigger atom. It's simply a larger atom in the uh, periodic table. So we'll have a little quiz, right? I'm going to give you three options. Well, four is the one you don't know. Um, what do you think these, these are, right? So if I tell you the brighter the atom, the bigger the Z number, this atomic number, what do you think this one is? Who hand, hands up if you think this is molybdenum? Come on. So on. There we go. What about selenium? Uh, in the same pot? Anyone? You think it's selenium? What about sulfur? Anyone? Oh, we got a few sulfurs for there. OK. Well, I'll put you out of your misery. It's, uh, these are molybdenums, right? Because the, the element we're looking at is molybdenum disulfide. 
and it has this hexagonal shape, right? It has this triangle of molybdenums and triangle of sulfurs. But what we've done with it, and we have our sulfurs, what we've done with it, we've actually implanted single uh, selenium ions in there to replace the sulfur atoms, which is what we see here. Well, this should be a sulfur position, but it's brighter, which means it's selenium. And then we also have, also have this kind of stuff that we actually, we, we can know what it is, but it's very difficult to know what it is, because we're looking at a two-dimensional projection of a 3D object, and even though it's a, almost a single layer of atoms, it's still quite difficult, especially when they start moving around and you're shooting it with 300 kilovolts of radiation. So these are just some images that we've taken over the years in the microscope. This is uh, one of my favorite ones, it's the gold sock. So every dot you see here is a gold atom. Um, we can look at these things called domain wall structures in which we can move this bright line across and hopefully that will be used in the future to turn systems on and off in memory. And we can plot and put, we can uh, analyze these structures and see um, are they polarized and indeed we do see it in these materials. We can see even more complex domain wall structures. In this image there are th around 30,000 atoms which means it's 30,000 uh, arrows. Uh, pointing in certain directions to tell you whether it's polarized on either side of this diagonal line, which means that we have two single domains. Uh, we can see these very exotic materials called skirmions. They're uh, very new and, and all that, but they're basically vortexes in three dimensions. You can see the, the, the material is actually twisting. And then we can also see the atoms that I showed earlier, and we can expand that into movies in which we can see the atoms moving around. And unfortunately, this isn't temporarily resolved, so you can't actually say that this atom is over here now, but you can have a good guess. So what can help us to analyze this stuff? Because this is a whole plethora of different material science problems, um, and well, Python can do it, and we have some great programs uh, in the last five, six years have come out in, uh, in Python, uh, especially uh, HyperSpy, uh, Atommap, uh, PyPrismatic, uh, the atomic simulation environment, and uh, some image registration uh, softwares. So I'll go through these one by one. Also, uh, some lo lots of code written by me, um, and if you, if you go into my, uh, my, my GitHub, you'll see a lot of really dodgy while loops, and then I realized you can use for loops for exactly what I was doing with those while loops. Uh, so you'll see about 10,000 lines of code, and every so often there's this random while loop, and you're like, why did you use a for loop for that? But anyway, so HyperSpy, basically, it's built on a NumPy array. That's it. It's simply an uh, n-dimensional NumPy array, and if the object is s, you call it with s.data. Um, we're mainly going to be talking about two-dimensional NumPy arrays here, basically just a, an image with, with pixels. Um, the signal type is the power of HyperSpy. You can call it s.signal. And it's about how you, basically HyperSpy is there to manipulate multi-dimensional multi data. Um, so if you can imagine uh, three-dimensional data viewed in, in three different ways, you can uh, analyze these in very different ways, because over here we have what you would kind of imagine as a movie. Uh, frame, right? You're going from frame to frame, but then if you split the data queues up and put the navigation dimension in X and Y now, and the signal is integrated over the Z column, um, we have different data types. And of course, the all-important metadata, which is always a problem in our field, and I think every field. Um, Atomapp is the thing I've been using and doing uh, some uh, development on. Um, it's made up of basically three main classes. So the atom position, which is made up of x, y coordinates, uh, and I've added the z coordinate, um, and an intensity and some other things. Basically, these are atoms that we saw before, our molybdenums and sulfurs, and atom position is simply just this position on that image. Uh, a sublattice is made up of a list of these atom positions, that class, on top of a two-dimensional hyperspy image. So it's just a two-dimensional uh, NumPy array, basically. So they're usually periodic, but they don't have to be, but they look like this. And then, an atom lattice is made up of several sublattices. So basically you have your first sublattice and then you have your second sublattice. And you, the more complicated these structures become, the, uh, the more sublattices you can have. Pi prismatic, I'll kind of fly through. Um, basically you just input uh, some coordinate file that we, we get from uh, our, our analysis um, that has a few uh, attributes. Um, in our experiment image, we create uh, some sort of model and then we uh, calculate the atomic potentials of each of these uh, elements, depending on their, their size, and then we simulate the electrons passing through these atomic potentials, and then we get a simulation. And we refine this on loop um, forever, and basically until you get some uh, global minimum. 
the atomic simulation environment is really, really amazing language that has it's basically taken lots of different labs uh, languages from all over the world and just translate them into Python. So now you can access all of these different either molecular dynamics codes or um, density functional theory codes. Uh, but I usually may, uh, use it for visualization. And then there's image registration. If you have a movie, you want to align those images uh, so you get either good signal to noise by stacking them, or if it's a movie and you want to look at each individual frame, they have to be aligned for you to constantly find those sublattices. So basically, there's a single image, 10 images looks a bit better, for example, and uh, there's lots of different filters you can apply in diffraction space. Um, but let's just quickly go through, oh, it's slow, a Jupyter notebook, all right? So, The, this is available, this Jupyter Notebook, uh, although you, I don't know if you'll be able to actually use it because it's some ad, like, wrangled code that I've, I've put in directly into this Jupyter Notebook, but if you go to the pink, pink schnack on, uh, on GitHub and go to the MMC 2D Materials uh, conference uh, repo I had, then this Jupyter Notebook, a version of it, will be on there. Uh, but basically, we first just we, uh, import some, um, some libraries. Uh, for example, we have our uh, uh, Atom Map and NumPy and uh, atomic simulation environment, all those ones we mentioned, as well as pandas and whatever you want to use, hyperspy, and then we, we, we plot uh, our data. So this is an actual uh, single raw image taken, and it's uh, pretty phenomenal um, because you can see these individual atoms, and then you can see things that, well, that shouldn't be there, and that shouldn't be there, and that shouldn't be there. Well, what, what's going on here? So we calibrate the data, um, basically using some internal reference or external reference, um, and then we filter it, right? So for our eyes, oh, I better, we, just let me just run that real quick. Um, if you have a look at this, it's a bit easier for us to see what's actually going on here there. It's better for our eyes and sometimes better for the computer. We then, uh, we're just gonna load Atom Lattice because we don't have time to go through the whole uh, steps, but it's actually really cool. It just uses a periodic structure, some pixel separation uh, and a tool from, uh, I think it's SK Image. Uh, underneath to basically uh, create this periodic structure. So we zoom in on the same area. My computer is a bit slow. Um, you can see all the blue sites uh, are molybdenum sites, right? So we haven't picked out these ones. And then we can pick those out in the second sublattice. We can pick out the center of the, the dark spaces in the third sublattice, for example, and then we can keep adding sublattices, which is what we'll do in a minute. We then do some um, algorithmic things in which we find um, the, the ratio of the, the intensities, and then we can scale everything off that. But I won't go into too much detail on that. Um, and then we find here, basically, the limits of those uh, ratios. We're, we're putting, okay, we're saying, within this range, we have molybdenum atoms, because they're meant to be this bright. Here, sulfurs, here, seleniums. And then we can do some refinements on that. If we have enough data points, we can um, set it, like, uh, 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 plot a Gaussian over it, for example, and find the error in our, in our fitting. And, and refine that over and over again until we have the best fit. And uh, if you look at the, sub, uh, the info that, we, say for example, I'm getting out from the sublattices, you have a um, single molybdenum atom, it has a position of 0 0.5, and that's because I've hard-coded these values in, right? So this is uh, older code. It's hard-coded because these materials have a known structure, right? They have a known crystal structure, uh, theoretically, uh, and now experimentally. But uh, I have some new code in there in which you have those, that gold sock, for example. You can just run this on it and say, okay, I think it's this thick. Give me the, take the bond length and that thickness, divide it up, and then say, okay, it's now a cylinder, and then you can see that model and move it around. Um, then we uh, create, a, it's called a crystallographic information file. It's basically an XYZ file uh, for plotting. So let me just, if I can, oh, is that working? This is a very old, um, oh, there we go, oh no, my computer is having a hard time, there we go, come on, oh no, right, so, for example, we have our original experimental image that has been filtered, and then we have our model that's been outputted, right, so we have a pretty good first approximation of what is actually making up this structure. Yeah, so we can then find out, okay, what, what, what did our experiment actually do? What kind of electronic properties do we think this will ha now have? We can do more experiments to verify that. How strong is it compared to the original structure? Um, 
Then we can create an actual XYZ file, for example, and we can simulate it like I showed before. And what we do is we, we create the simulation and then we compare um, that simulation to our experiment uh, with some mean standard error or structural similarity index or some, some sort of algorithm. Um, and then we say, okay, what's the, what, when are they most alike when you put a Gaussian blur across it or as you vary the Gaussian blur? So this is our original simulation and you can see that it's just really, really uh, fine points. Then we blur it out and we get some match, some sort of match between our simulation and our experiment and they look pretty similar. Um, so you can go in one by one uh, and look at whether, okay, we have, I don't know, this is a, a dodgy GUI. We have, say, a comparison here between, uh, and we're going to draw a line profile across these intensities, simply as that, uh, and we're going to see, um, okay, how do they match up and wh why are we getting these errors? Where are these uh, differences coming from? Is that because our simulation isn't good enough? Do we need to Higher, run a higher resolution simulation, for example, and we can refine that as well. And the way we do that is we actually just compare the image, the whole image, together. Um, and also, by the way, these simulation softwares, uh, they, this just came out in 2019, start 2019, it used to take, I would say, at least two or three hours to create, or even more, this is a 1K by 1K image, to create one of these images, and this new program <coughs> is the only reason I can do this, basically. But we basically compare the image, uh, experimental image to the uh, simulation. We get the inverse of that as well. And we try and find new um, sub-lattices, what atoms we've missed. So if you look on the edge here at the very bottom, I don't know if you can even see that. Those, there's little bright spots. It's going to pick that up because it said new atoms found, adding to a new sub-lattice, right? And we can see if your initial fit is good, then it'll just be edge cases that you're picking up, right? And again, you're going to refine this constantly until you have all the atoms that you can possibly find in your structure. And then we refine them in place, for example. We overlay our current um, sublattice and we say, okay, is the, did we fit this into the correct box at the start? Because we've now changed our structure from the last step. So we keep changing that as well. And uh, outside of some, say, standard deviation, for example. And then we can plot, for example, no refine in, in blue on the left, and then uh, the first ref, uh, refinement, and then the second refinement. And we can just see that, oh, look, we have uh, some increase in atoms here. We've, we've changed from vacancies over to, oh, now we have way more. Um, uh, well, these are also vacancies. But things are changing. But this is a single image, and we've done one refine each. Right? So you can imagine if you do that refine 100 times on one image, and then you have 500 images, you have a lot of stuff going on, and it takes a while, um, which is why someone maybe who is a machine learning specialist may tell me, oh, you could just do this, and it would make it way faster. You could train your data off all of the signals that we already have. So um, I will quickly go through, I don't know how much time we've left. I actually stopped my timer, and there's no one here to tell me. So you're stuck in here forever. Uh, let me just, sorry, just go down here. Yeah, so what about movies, right? This is always the cool, the cool thing. So we want to find all these materials, uh, material science uh, problems, figure them out. And uh, one of the things I want to do is find out what's the threshold for radiation damage that will cause these materials to be destroyed. And you can see here we have our experimental image and then we have our uh, model that we've created. And this has been refined about 100 times, I reckon. And you can see at one point something goes wrong. There's some the electron beam is destroying it, and then this massive hole forms. And those holes don't uh, fix themselves. In some materials they do, in these ones we don't, we don't see that they do. Um, so what we want to find out is things like how many atoms are in each image um, over time, uh, what uh, type of atoms are there, what elements do we see, and what kind of features are we looking out for. Um, this one may take a minute. Uh, and then we can say, okay, we looked at that radiation dose, let's just increase that radiation dose. So it's increasing downwards. It's always a good plot to have. Um, so we see our, our experiment on the left, our simulation uh, in the middle, and a model on the right. And you can see for different um, doses uh, that we have uh, different uh, effects. And especially at the bottom, we have some threshold. We've hit some threshold. It said, oh god, this is way too much radiation. I can't handle this. And it's destroyed the atom. And then all the big, a big hole is formed. Right? So you can see that 
at frame 25, I think it was, we increased the, the, the dose, right? And that meant, oh no, we're losing atoms, basically. And that's pretty uh, straightforward, if you think about it, right? We're just increasing radiation, we're damaging it, but to be able to quantify it is something that Python has allowed me uh, to try to do. Uh, and then we can also look at, for example, just the whole size uh, using other uh, programs in uh, Python. It doesn't have an API yet, but uh, it's called Elastic. It's fantastic for uh, image segmentation, and they're implementing machine learning things with that as well. But you can see, like, very obvious correlation. Molybdenum is going down, uh, whole size is going up. And again, we increased um, the, the radiation uh, dose around here, and you can see, oh no, we've got a big hole. So, what I want really with, with, with this and all this code that um, uh, some of it I've written, most of it is in these packages, is to link all these packages together and to uh, basically make it applicable for all material science problems, or most of them, or let people add to it, right? Because that's what people are doing now in the, in the, in the field, and obviously it's, an, it's completely given in, uh, in Python that it's all collaboration, open source collaboration. But it's really fantastic for years, um, I think, the electron microscopy field has had uh, proprietary formats. We don't know what the formats are, how they're structured, uh, and now we have all this stuff that we can just really go into the data, dig into the data, and see what's going on. Um, and uh, yeah, so I want to basically be able to input the material and to click go, and to get some polarization information, to count the atoms, to see the atoms moving, track them around the image, uh, and stuff like that. Um, so basically, I'd like to uh, thank a lot of people. There's all these packages. Um, uh, that I've mentioned, um, and I'd like to just thank everyone in the group, everyone in, in the University of Limerick, uh, collaborators without which I would have uh, no uh, information to look at and uh, I'd be pretty stupid, and then for all the, over the years, all the people that allowed me to travel uh, to conferences like this, and really this is uh, an amazing conference to come to because I can get help on Python rather than standing in a room and every single person knows so much more than me about the atom stuff, basically. Every single person has been doing it for 50 years and uh, they're like, oh, that's wrong, that's wrong. Which is good too, right? It's always good. But that's in academia. This is much more chilled, we'll say. Yeah. Um, so basically, that's it. Thank you very much for listening and uh, have, a, have a good evening, have a good Sunday. <laughs>